You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. Hey, how's everyone doing? And welcome along to my podcast, Straight to Video. On today's show, I speak to guitarists for the bands Bullet Boys and The Hot Summers, Mick Swader. Okay, as some of you might know, I'm going to be a little bit biased here. I love Bullet Boys and even got the chance to play bass for them between 2007 and 2009. They're one of my favorite bands of the Hollywood hard rock era and to this day their albums still hold a great fire and originality that a lot of other bands perhaps struggle to do. I've never had the chance to speak to Mick as he wasn't in the band back when I was playing with them so this was super cool for me to do and me more than anyone finds it so great that the original four members of the band are now back together and all set for a summer of live dates as restrictions all over the world are slowly being lifted. Now Mick is an incredibly underrated guitar player. If you listen to those first three Bullet Boys albums which he played on, the guitar playing is off the scale in both tone, style and attitude. There's all these angular sounds going off and it has so much character. I mentioned my love for the band's second album Freak Show which is so off the wall but amazing at the same time and really a very ballsy and creative move by the band. If you've not heard it then please track it down along with checking out Mick's brand new band The Hot Summers who have released a couple of early singles but a full release is set to drop this summer. They've got some great pop tunes. For everything you could need to know about Mick, Bullet Boys and Hot Summers, then dive online at mickswader.com or bulletboysofficial.com. Now, whilst you're checking those out, please pay our friends Dead School Coffee a visit over at deadschoolcoffee.co.uk. These guys are really smashing things right now with their delicious and amazing brand of coffee available in beans or fully ground. Whichever you prefer, and to add to their awesome, they're offering listeners to this show 15%. Yes, 15% off your order by simply adding the promo code STV when you check out. If you're listening to the show through our website at stvpod.com, you don't even have to remember the promo code. Simply click on the Dead School Coffee logo in our banner, which will take you to their site, fill your shopping cart, and the discount will be added on checkout. Super easy! So on with the show, we talk about some cool stuff with Mick, including his introductions to guitar, getting the gig with Carmine Apisa's King Cobra prior to forming Bullet Boys, and also a meeting with the King of Pop himself, Michael Jackson, at Hollywood's legendary Tower Records on Sunset Strip. Hope you enjoy listening to this as I chat with Bullet Boys and Hot Summers guitarist Mick Swader. things you're doing all right yeah doing great thank you how are you i'm good mate a little bit tells me it's your birthday tomorrow yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah one more man i get to i get to have another one that's great excellent stuff so whereabouts are you are you actually in near hollywood or are you just in the california area yeah i'm in a place called granada hills which is a little further out but close enough to hollywood to smell it close enough but just far enough away yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's uh, there's a lot of space out here, which is what we uh, we like. So we like being out here in Granada Hills for now anyway. Well, it's very cool to finally say hello to you after all these years. Yeah, it's been many years. I think I'm bullet boy number 48. <laughs> Something 48, like yeah. Right on. Well, you're right up there. How was your show the other week? You have a good time? Uh, yeah, we did have a good time. It was nice to get out and, and see people sort of loosen up a little bit. So, yeah, you know, I mean, the first one back, everybody had a little uh, little nervous activity going on, but it ended up being great. We had a fun time. Awesome stuff. Awesome. If I'm right, you were born in, is it Gowanda, New York? Yeah, it's called uh, Gowanda, a little town in western New York. Basically, I kind of filter it down to Buffalo whenever somebody asks, because I grew up in really small towns, you know, Gowanda and Randolph and Jamestown, and they were all uh, pretty much, you know, widespread 
spots in the road. Because that's like right near the Canadian border, isn't it? It really is. It seems like I had a, an affection for Canadian bands. So yeah, I think the geography had a lot to do with that. There's a lot of great underrated rock bands came down from Canada. I spoke to a few Canadian musicians and like they had like their whole little scene in a way. Yeah, I mean, beginning with Rush and, and Max Webster. And I mean, I liked Coney Hatch back in the day. And, you know, a lot of bands that people might not necessarily have heard of, but they were big influences on me. I guess hockey was a big thing for you then as well, being kind of in the Canadian area. Yeah, that was kind of what I was doing in and where I had hoped to go with my life before uh, I got my first guitar. I mean, I was never that good, but, you know, I always had aspirations to, you know, play. And it was a lot of fun for me. I really enjoyed it. But it seemed like as soon as I got my guitar, I uh, it just kind of fell off the map. I and mean, I, I didn't play for, what, another decade and decade and a half. And then uh, somebody said, hey, why don't you come skate with us one night? And I just happened to lug my gear around this old army bag. I lugged it around for, like I said, a decade and a half. And uh, when I finally pulled it out, it was, it was in pretty bad shape. Yeah, it'd not gone moldy or anything like that. Oh man, it all fell apart. I, I wore it that first night and uh, <laughs> everything was just like falling away from me. And I, I just went out and bought all new stuff the next day. I think I've heard you tell the story a few times, but I think it's kind of essential for your timeline for anyone who hasn't heard it. But your interest in guitar was born from simply seeing a local kid in the neighborhood sat outside playing a guitar. Is that right? Yeah, it was wild because uh, I had always been a fan of music, you know, but I hadn't been introduced to anybody actually playing at that point. I don't know how you describe it other than to say that it was so far removed, it wasn't even a consideration, at least that I remember. Something that people on the TV do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so when I saw him sitting there playing it, it all became visceral, you know, and it just resonated at that point with me and uh, haven't stopped since. What was he playing? Was it like just an unplugged electric guitar? or was he playing an acoustic guitar or was it through a little amp? Yeah, he had a Fender Thin Line, which is kind of a hollowed, semi-hollow version of a Telecaster. So, uh... Yeah, and he, we ended up starting a band. All oh, right, you actually hooked up as friends and joined a band with him. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. Somebody had to show us what to do. Was he a similar age to you? Uh, he was a little bit younger. I think a couple of grades younger. Yeah. But we were all underage. I mean, we ended up playing bars and when we weren't supposed to. And so it was, uh, there was an element of danger there too. So how much attention had you actually paid to music before then? Was you a fan of any particular bands? Because I know Cheap Trick's a big band for you. Yeah, later on when I discovered them, that was huge. But at that point, my dad's eight tracks were like Tommy James and the Shondells and Tommy Rowe and Bobby Sherman and all these sorts of uh, bubblegum pop tunes. And I... Uh, Spent a lot of my younger years when I was eight or whatever, and my uh, my grandmother owned a bar, you know, and she had a jukebox, and I would just spend hours at that jukebox. I'd crawl around and look for money that they dropped behind the bar, and that's what I would use to play all these songs. You didn't have a shortcut for the jukebox, some kind of trick to get free play. No, I didn't have a trick, but those songs still play with me today, you know, it, it's fun to hear them. My uncle had uh, like Iron Butterfly records and I'm trying to remember some of the other things that he had. I mean, he had a Beach Boys record too that I remember. And that evolved into, let's see, the records. I could probably count all the records I had at that point. Yeah. I didn't feel like a like a normal listener. Like I was dissecting parts and... Like arrangements and things like that. Yeah. So by the time it became clear to me that I could play guitar too... I almost felt like I had a little bit of a head start because I had, you know, done so much research, as it were. What year would this have been? Oh, boy. 71, maybe. 10, 11 years old. When was the first time you got to see, like, a live band? Well, I was 13 when I went to see Emerson, Lake and Palmer, Leonard Skinner, and James Gang. I can't believe my mom, she dropped my friend and I off and just left in this huge stadium. And at that time, people were puking and smoking pot, which I thought was a very interesting smell. And people were tripping out. And it was a it was a wild time, a very wild experience. And then a couple of years later, when I wanted to go see the Stones at the same place, she said, no, I've heard too much. I'm going with you if you're going at all. So my mom actually took me to a Rolling Stones concert in 75. Who was like the first guitar guy to like blow your mind? Was it seeing it live at a gig? Oh, live? Oh, boy. I suppose Skinner would have made an impression at that point but I'm trying to remember that's a great question I remember seeing Queen that was the first time I'd ever seen anybody use their right hand to fret a note so I was I was pretty impressed by that and it wasn't like he was doing any tapping I mean he literally just went, 
And I thought, oh my God, that's wild. That was before I, I think Van Halen had even come out. What tour would that have been for Queen then? What, that must have been an amazing show. Remember the double live record they did with the RGB lights, you know, the red, green, blue or whatever they were. That, that was the tour that I saw. I can't remember when that was, but it seemed like it was later 70s. You had a band called The Pedestrians. Was that the same band with this same guy or was this like later bands further on down the line? We'd parted ways, but it was essentially the same band from high school. I mean, we we did a lot of high school dances with uh, with that guy that had the Telecaster. But by the time we moved on to The Pedestrians, it was pretty much down to the three of us, the drummer, the bass player and I. And we did have another guitar player at that point who had since passed on. But that was a fun band because it, we had started to reach out a little bit outside of our boxes and, and we were transforming songs like rock and roll and playing them with different grooves and trying to make them as Devo-esque as possible at that time. And, and we were influenced by punk at that point, but I was still playing Jeff Beck instrumental. So it was a weird amalgam. People could come and dance and hear songs that they wouldn't normally hear. And it was it was a really fun band. I loved that. Was original music working its way into it? Not as much. We I think we probably had three or four tunes that we did. Uh, but we would put together medleys of, you know, the theme from Hawaii Five-0 with the Pink Panther. And, and we just had a great time playing guitars. It was a great time because we used to play in this little place called the Gatsby, which was almost like a little 20s prohibition hideaway. And it was pretty small, but the place would get packed on the weekends. And it was just one of those things you remember for the rest of your life. So how far afield was you playing? Was it a band where you go out for a couple of days? We ended up doing a couple of tours. We were, we uh, somehow got connected with this older lady who was doing a Janis Joplin thing. So we became her backup band and drove down south. And uh, I'm sure she took all the money. I don't think we made any. But, you know, it was uh, the price of an education. And we did that. I think we did a couple of other little things like that, but mostly we just stayed in our area, Pennsylvania, Jamestown, Western New Yorkish kind of thing. When did the bug start to infiltrate, like thinking I need to move to the West Coast? Was there a particular incident or any offers? Not necessarily a particular incident, but we had sort of tired of that small area that we were in and, and we decided that we would pack up and throw our stuff in a homemade trailer and, and drive out to LA. It ended up just being the bass player and I, and we talked about considering reforming once we got to California. But at that point, we kind of went our separate ways and started over at that point. I ended up, I think, in a, in a band with a guy who used to play with who was the old timer that did uh, that song, Fire? I was going to ask you that. I've heard you mention it. The crazy world of Arthur Brown. Yeah, Arthur Brown. He used to, he was, I guess he was the keyboard player, but he kind of took that torch and was carrying it. So, you know, we were wearing, I was wearing a hockey mask and a big old red spandex thing. Do you remember what the band was called? What was that band called? I think it was called Kingdom. How was the audition for that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, let me think. I, I had just gotten a, a Stratocaster that, had a hard time staying in tune. So I remember fighting that a little bit. Yeah. Evidently they liked what I was doing and they, and they probably liked that I was willing to, you know, put on a costume and perform in that way, which I love doing. I, back East, you probably heard me tell the story about this band, Black Pearl, where we went on the road and, and had the kabuki makeup and the white fright wigs and platform shoes and everything. And, and it was really fun to sort of put that veil up and, you know, be able to go outside of who I was and, and learn to perform. You kind of feel a bit more, I don't know what the word is, but you feel a bit more comfortable just to let yourself go, I think, when you feel you're a little bit covered up. That's right. And it's like you're disguised and you can take it off and you know walk around and and if you felt like you did something stupid nobody could accuse you of it you know at that point so but that that's was kind of my thing i loved performance uh and people who projected you know somebody like dave roth was very impressive to me what was your impression of hollywood when you first arrived was there a scene starting to take off it was wild because we lived right on melrose and it always seemed like i was into heavier rock at that point like the first Aussie records with Randy were out and I was really impressed by those and I was studying all the Michael Schenker I could but most of where I lived was kind of uh 
I can't, I don't even know what they called it. This, the stray cat thing, you know, where everybody was sort of rockabilly kind of trip and the, and the stores are all sort of focused on, on selling those kinds of things. And most of the people walking down the street had, you know, that sort of look. There were times when it felt kind of uncomfortable to be down there because they, they didn't really appreciate where, where I was coming from at that point. But that's what it seemed like at the time. And then at around that time, I guess, Quiet Riot and Motley came out and, you know, Motley was selling out the whiskey and that was really impressive. And ultimately their record came out and started getting some local airplay. So things started to sort of come around for those of us that liked it heavier. Because didn't you have a job working at Tower Records? Yeah, I uh, had been playing in this cover band and and figured I needed to break away from that if I was ever going to do any original music. And so, yeah, I just took a job at Tower Records and uh, the rest is history from there. Did they have any cool in-stores whilst you were there? Michael Jackson came in one time after we had closed. Right. And uh, he had he had a little kid with him. I, I You probably know who he was. I, I didn't, but uh, I think he was a child actor. But it was uh, it was a classic me, right? He comes in and he comes over to the cassettes and he's really sweet and he's very gentle and and you can tell he's just this kind soul. And, uh, he said, "So what's good here? What's what's the latest thing that I might like?" And I I broke out a Scorpions cassette. Here, Michael, check this out. You'll dig this. This is fantastic. It was Love at First Sting. It had just come out, and I love that record. You know, Matthias is was one of my favorites too. But it's it's just kind of funny to to press a Scorpions record into his hand and watch him go like, oh, yeah, okay. Did he take it? Did you sell it to him? No. He got away from me as soon as he could. (laughs) I love it. And it was through Tower Records that the whole King Cobra connection sparked, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm just flashing right now on, I think we had closed down the store and I was outside and I happened to look over and I saw Rudy Schenker just standing on the corner and there wasn't really anything there to go to. I didn't know why he was standing there, but he was fully decked out. And I just went over and I said, Rudy, what's going on, man? How are you? And just introduced myself. And there's just a guy that worked at Tower at that point. But I, you know, I told him I loved the new record and all that. So anyway, that's, that's an aside to, to see Rudy Schenker just standing on Sunset doing nothing. Um yeah, I uh, I was approached by Carmine's manager, or I guess he, w- he would have been King Cobra's manager at that time, and uh, they wanted a bass player, so just said, well, thanks anyway. Just get someone who looks good. It'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, I guess at that point, I don't. I swear to God, I was telling my wife uh, last night, in fact, that I think what happened is the guitar player in the band somehow like burned his hair off when he was dying it, and I don't know if they're having trouble with him aside from that as well but anyway he didn't do his test did he, he did. 24 hours yeah before. yeah at any rate uh carmine came in about a week later and said he needed a guitar player and we had the conversation and everything sort of started after that that's a really crummy way to lose your spot in a band with a oh, record yeah. deal <laughs> that's why i was thinking about it because i imagined i imagined that whole scene must have been really awful Uh, Wow. (laughs) Because you was on the verge of like moving back to the East Coast, right? You didn't feel things were working out? Yeah, I I wasn't really happy in L.A. at that point. I wasn't playing out enough and and wasn't playing the kind of music that I wanted to play. So, yeah, I actually had plans and had actually gone back and, and auditioned or played with this band. So I think that was in the works and something I was really considering at the time that my joining King Cobra happened. How was that whole transition for you going straight into a band already with like a deal? Was that kind of a big jump? It didn't really feel like it, although it, you know, it was a little bit intimidating, you know, jumping in with Carmine and of course, Mark, uh, Mark Free at that time uh, was a fantastic singer and everybody, everybody played really well. So it was fun for me, you know, it was a, it was a great learning experience and it sort of pushed me into spending more time on my songwriting and, and developing my craft and certainly working on my guitar playing. So it was a great situation for me. Those guys were fun and, and very professional all at the same time. And I appreciated that. How much studio experience had you had prior to that? At that point, just done a couple of demos, or at least I thought they were demos, they ended up in one case being a, a record that people still contact me about. So I've been in the studio quite a bit. I've probably done, you know, 10 sessions or so up to that point. But I was sort of in charge of what I was doing at that time. It wasn't like there was a producer who was overseeing it. So that was that was the change for me when we went in and did about, a, I'd say, a couple of weeks of pre-production. That was interesting because I'd never really had somebody 
sort of tear apart the songs and microanalyze them. Yeah. Later on in King Cobra, you was joined by Mark and Lonnie, who would eventually join you in Bullet Boys. Had any of you crossed paths in town prior to them getting the gig? Was you aware of either of them? No. Uh Uh-uh. No, that was uh, my first introduction. I know when we were doing the... The second record production, pre-production, I should say, with Dwayne Hitchings. I think Mark came by at that point and I, I met him, but uh, it was it was almost just kind of an off-the-cuff sort of thing. I didn't, there was no real meaning behind any of it. Because um, you eventually left King Cobra and was joined by Mark and Lonnie and then later Jimmy to form Bullet Boys. Because of the King Cobra connection, was it a little more, I don't want to say easy, but was it a more straightforward for you to like generate a buzz and an interest? Was people already showing interest in the band? No, not really. We basically just started woodshedding and, and working on songs. At that point, I, I don't know how we were or didn't know how we were going to uh, generate any interest until I saw... Somebody from King Cobra's merchandising crew on uh, the strip one night, and uh, he said, "Hey, I'm jumping into management. So if you ever have anything you want me to listen to, let me know." And that's how we connected with him, and that's really started the ball rolling. At that point, it was just kind of a you know serendipitous meeting. I say it's crazy how you never know. Just that one random night leads to that connection. It's bizarre, and it must happen so many times out there. We felt very fortunate for that because we really didn't struggle for years. I mean, obviously, we'd all been in different bands and done our struggling. But as far as that band goes, things seem to happen pretty quickly. Even though we were, by the time we got signed, we were on our last legs. I mean, we were all pretty broke. What was the, kind of like the energy like when the four of you first played for the first time? Because that original lineup is insane. Everyone is like a game in their particular role in my opinion. Was there a specific energy for you guys where you thought, holy shit, I've not felt this before? Yeah, when when Jimmy joined the band, it definitely took on a life that we hadn't known with the previous drummer. So that was really the moment when we realized, okay, this can be a powerful unit here. That was when everything really started to sort of take off. What were the first songs you jammed on? Did you go straight into original stuff or did you try out some covers? I had already written some material for the band, but I remember playing... uh, with Jimmy Misty Mountain Hop. Yeah, when he came in with that drum fill, I just thought, okay, cool. We've got a band now. <laughs> That's pretty much all it took for me. How many shows did you do prior to signing your record deal? Was it like straight showcasing or did you ever have to do like the flyering on the scene like all the other bands? We didn't do a lot of that. We did some, but I think we only played maybe eight or 10 shows total. And a lot of those in the same places. We played a club down in the South Beach area um, quite a bit. But uh, we did a showcase. We got our manager got us like five grand to do a demo for Columbia CBS. And uh, they passed on that demo and the showcase. I guess they didn't see anything there. So at that point, we had a demo that we couldn't shop for 30 days. So we kind of waited that out. And then when the 30 days came around, we started generating some interest at that point. Once you'd recorded the album, you said that it didn't initially fly out of the gate. Was you not allowed to tour or just the label didn't see the point in it? Yeah, I think the latter. They didn't They didn't want us to go out because the, the record at that point didn't have any legs and it didn't look like it was going to be sustainable. Which sounds crazy. Like, how are you going to break a new band? Yeah. Get them out on the road so people can hear you and go out and buy your record the next day. <laughs> Yeah, they literally, that was, uh, when did it come out? Sometime in September or something like that. And they wanted us to sit around till the next year. And anybody that knew us would have said, oh no, that's that's death. You can't do that. This band may not make it past the beginning of the year. And uh, so we ended up going out with Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson, which was great. I mean, two of my heroes, but they were only playing, you know, little like dinner clubs with, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 people tops. That's always weird when you see that these people you held on such a high pedestal, then all of a sudden you see the reality, the curtains drawn sometimes. Yeah, totally, totally. But we, uh, you know, at that point we were just happy to be out and happy to be playing because like I said, Warner Brothers didn't, they didn't want us out at all. Again, that was a a very, it was a difficult time because like I said, the record really wasn't doing anything. So by the time we ended up filming the video for Smooth Up, and I'm not even sure that, I think that video had come out and had to be re-released or re-presented to MTV. So I think that was on its second time around too. And luckily it caught hold and 
And that's when everything just started to cascade. Very cool. It caught on MTV. Were you guys right on the road? You had no way of seeing the reaction to the video or how the requests are going in, but you just saw the buzz growing at shows. It was pretty immediate. I mean, I'm sure you've heard this story when we went up to do a couple of dates with Cheap Trick and then we added a couple of club dates to get us there and back. Cheap Trick shows were great, had a wonderful time, but you can't really gauge how many of those people are there to see you, if any, right? So by the time we went to the next club, I was upstairs just practicing, not really paying attention to what was going down. Figured it'd be another, you know, 30, 40 people. And uh, we'd have a great time and go home. When I started walking down the stairs to go do the set, the place was packed. And somebody said, dude, there's people around the block. First thing I thought was, well, do they know it's us? Do they think somebody else is playing or what, what's going on here? And that was the point where Smooth Up had started to kick in and people started to know who we were. And it was pretty wild because it was almost uh, instantaneous, or at least it felt that way. You didn't have it as your first song in the set, did you? Like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've done that in the past. Probably not the the best choice to make, but we were trying to have fun. I've heard you and Jimmy speak before that you guys were so locked in in the live setting, even in like the biggest high profile gigs, you were happy to go off on a tangent during a song and improvise during all these huge gigs. You were so in sync with each other. Did you enjoy that element? Like, let's see where this goes. Oh, yeah. To me, it was necessary. You know, I know a lot of people not very comfortable doing that. And they sort of have to learn their parts and and play them to a T. And I've never been that guy. I like to improvise even in the studio when I possibly can. So to me, yeah, that's an integral part of our shows, something that uh, keeps everything fresh and, and keeps my mind, you know, working and keeps the wheels turning. I insist on it. And I'm just happy that uh, the guys in my band are, 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 you know, the same ilk. They, They appreciate it too. And they understand the value of it. Like I've always said, I don't, I mean, probably goes without saying in any band really, but I don't ever have to think about those guys or worry about them. You know, I I can go in a direction that I want to go in and I know they'll be with me. They'll have my back and vice versa. And it's a really great feeling. And one of the reasons that uh, I suppose we all keep coming back together after all these years. Do you have any particular memories of touring the UK on that first Bullet Boys record? Oh, all good ones. I had such a good time over there and it was at the end of doing all the, you know, all the rounds in, in America. So, you know, it should have been a time when we were all really tired and exhausted. But for me, it sort of injected new life into me because it was someplace I'd always wanted to go. And I got to see some things that I had always wanted to see and some other things I didn't expect to. So, uh, and the people were great. They really were. I, I was worried that maybe we wouldn't be received so kindly, just things I'd heard. Couldn't have been further from the truth. You know, on the street with people, had great conversations and felt very comfortable. And and it was it was really a, a time that I would love to relive. You went out to do Freak Show, which I think is such a crazy but beautiful album. Where were you pulling ideas from for that record? Because like THC Groove is the lead single. That's such a ballsy move. <laughs> yeah, it really was. And, and probably not, not the brightest one, from at least from a business standpoint. But we wanted to make a point and... I think we did. Yeah, that was, it was a a more collaborative effort. I think we, we spent a lot more time sitting down and throwing ideas back and forth. And a lot of it came from uh, that record kind of gestated on the tour bus for the first album. And uh, we just talked about what we'd seen throughout our short careers and through the life of that first record. And we certainly had a different feel for the business and, and how things operated and And it came off maybe a little more cynical than perhaps we intended. But at the same time, it it was all really meant to be tongue in cheek and and descriptive of what we'd been through. I did an interview with a guy who just loved that first record. and, And you could tell that he was just heartbroken, almost angry that we did Freak Show. It's like, you guys were so fun and it was so light and happy. And what happened? I sound angry and miserable and what's going on? It's like, dude, I'm sorry. We were just, you know, it's still fun. It's still fun. You did three killer records with Bullet Boys, which I think truly hold up today, but you left the band in 93, but then returned for the Burning Cats Best Of later in 2000, which for me personally was superb for me to learn Lonnie's bass parts when I had to the songs because <laughs> everything is so raw in the mix you can hear everything yeah the fun part for me was just being able to have a record of those songs after having been on the road because like we were talking about earlier when we did that first record we really hadn't gelled as a unit as uh, much as we would have after you know being on tour a lot of guys get to make their first record when they've been together for 10 years 
and playing clubs and doing tours. And we didn't have that luxury. So by the time I left the band, I felt like we really had a symbiosis that was worthy of, you know, doing a live record. Unfortunately, we didn't get to it till then, which was what many years past that point. But it was still fun to sit in the studio and reimagine those songs, as it were. During your time away from Bullet Boys, you continue to be in bands with great names, by the way, Brainstem Babies with Jason Hook. And was it Lollygag with Troy Patrick Farrell? Yeah. But what can you tell me about your 2007 record, the Songs in the Key of Cool by Mick oh. <laughs> and the Candy Bar Band? That's some great power pop, almost like punk pop songs, but for kids. How did that whole project come about and what was the reception to it? Well, uh, my wife gets a lot of credit for that because she really inspired a lot of those songs and and the general idea. But I I was on board. I mean, when I had my first son, it was life changing for me. It really made me look at things in in a different way, as as I'm sure everybody would say. And I just felt like that whole genre was a bit underserved and I could contribute something that at least I hadn't heard before because most of the most of the kids songs were well as you'd imagine you know shoulders knees neck and toes or whatever that is so I wanted to do something that was that maybe adults could have an easier time listening to as well who's actually on that record is it just you doing all the parts or is it was there a band yeah I had uh, I had a couple of drummers come in but I did everything else and that was part of it for me too I was I had just gotten a new piece of uh, a new DAW in my studio. So I was learning that at the time and there was really no better way to sort of put my feet to the fire than to make a record. And that was the one that came out. Did it open any doors? Was there a reception from my audiences who'd never heard it before? I'm not a salesperson. I have a very difficult time even networking, meeting people. I'm kind of an introvert, if not even a misanthrope. So for me, I like to produce and make records. And if I don't have the infrastructure to support that, which at that time I I really didn't, then there's no hope for it because I don't, I don't provide any. So that's kind of why that really didn't generate, uh, generate much more than just being done. I thought it's great. It's still readily available on like iTunes. Oh, that's cool. There was a brief New Year's Eve reunion for Bullet Boys a few years ago with the original lineup. But then the official reunion was announced. Was it last year now, pre-pandemic? I think we did a show in 2019 at the very end, uh, the whiskey. And then we went on the boat in 2020. And I remember before we got on the boat, they were saying, all right, well, we got this thing in Asia. And so anybody that's coming from Asia is not going to be able to get on the boat. And there was, you know, it was starting to bubble to the surface, this whole pandemic. And uh, I still look back at that in, in amazement. And I'm very happy that everybody on that boat was able to get off of it without becoming sick because that could have been the super spreader moment. And it wasn't. So uh, that was it. We got to do that show on the boat. And every all the dates we had coming in just kept getting pushed back and pushed back. And they're still getting pushed back at this point. But we're going to try to fulfill like, each and every one of those. There's been a lot of things said over the years back and forth, but it seems now you've all kind of come together on the same page and it's really exciting prospect. How was it, not just for you, but for everyone at this part in your career to be back together? Are you all in like a more comfortable place to make it all happen? Yeah, I mean, everybody's, you know, everybody's different in certain ways, but not not much has changed. And, and certainly uh, the way we play is... That hasn't changed. We we still love to get together and feel like we have this kinship, you know, that we can't get anywhere else. So that's really the, the motivating factor for most of us. You know, we genuinely enjoy each other's company. Certainly when we have disagreements, you know, we work through it like everybody else does. But it's really, uh, it feels like home, you know, playing with these guys. Your other project, Hot Summers, that's kind of allows you to bring forward your pop passions to run alongside Bullet Boys. What bands do you pull influences when you approach that? Is it bands which you grew up with or are you always pulling stuff from modern day? Do you listen to a lot of modern day stuff? I try to. I'm not very good at it. I'm more uh, listening to post-rock these days, instrumental stuff. And, and that's kind of where my, my tastes are at the moment, more cinematic things. But I still love, you know, my 2020 records, David Werner, who actually, it's funny, I don't know, probably never heard the record. It's a fantastic record that Bob Clearmountain finished up. But my uh, engineer from the first couple of Bullet Boys records was on that record, too. It's fantastic. If you can find it, I don't think it's in CD, but uh, David Werner, it's great records. So, yeah, those those pop influences seem to bubble to the surface. And, and Shane, to start, the singer in Hot Summers, is... Uh, 
is a kindred spirit in that regard. He he likes a lot of the same things and we have that in common. So it's really fun to get together and have all those, you know, those melodies and those quirky little things that uh, are only found in pop come to the surface and be unapologetic about it. Is there any live possibilities with that? Would you get a band together? Or? Yeah, we're hoping to at some point. We'd love to get together and play. At this point, uh, we've got such a backlog of music that needs to be mixed. And I'm in the process of doing that right now. So things are coming out in bits and pieces, but we're planning on having a, a full, uh, whether it's going to be an EP or a full length record, we're not sure, but sometime in early July. I never realized you had a podcast a few years ago, Scratchcast. Yeah. Any plans to bring that back during the current podcast boom? I would uh, I would like to. I really loved doing them. I had a great time. The problem is that I'm such a, such a perfectionist that I, like you, you know, get into editing and it doesn't, doesn't seem to stop. It's like, oh my God, I just, all right, I just have to abandon it. So it ended up being way more time consuming, maybe in, you know, maybe at some point I'll get back into it, but now's not the right time, but it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Well, thank you ever so much, Mick. I don't want to take up too much time of yours, but I've loved getting the chance to connect with you. And um, I look forward to hearing news on Hot Summers and Bullet Boys once um, things can get back to some kind of normal. Yeah, well, we've uh, we've been buddies online for a long time and it was nice to finally chat with you. And and uh, I had a lot of fun, man. And, and I hope you stay in touch. Thanks. All right, you take care, man. Have a good birthday tomorrow. Uh, thank you so much. Be safe. Big thank you to Mick Swader for taking some time to chat with me here on the Straight to Video podcast. Mick was a lot of fun and I appreciated all the stories and memories he shared. As mentioned earlier, please check out MickSwader.com and BulletBoysOfficial.com and you can also find Mick on Instagram at simply Mick Swader. That's S-W-E-D-A. Cheers to all of you for your support for the show. Please check out all earlier episodes over at stvpod.com. And if you want, you can also pick up a straight-to-video t-shirt while you're there too. This is officially essential wear as we start heading into the summer. We also have a support page where you can buy me a coffee, which sends a small donation of your choice to help go towards costs involved in putting together a podcast like this and also upgrade all my gear, which I have no idea how to use. It means a lot for you all to keep returning and checking out these chats. Really appreciate your messages and reviews which keep coming in, so please don't stop those. And until I speak to you all again, take care of yourselves and let's do this again soon. Mm-hmm.